So before we start, uh, we have a few announcements and then we'll go with any introductions for the new members of the working group. Uh, the few announcements we have is next week, we have our SBP BRIMS conference uh, going to happen virtual. Um, the workshop, sorry, the program for the conference is online. You can take a look at the website and we have some exciting tracks on disinformation challenge and also some domestic extremism uh, track on uh, parlor data challenge. So if uh, you're interested, take a look at the conference website. Um, we still have a few student scholarships or early career scholarships. So if you have students or colleagues who would like to attend, uh, feel free to share the information with them. They can get registered with the conference and the scholarship uh, will cover the registration costs. So in case uh, you are looking to attend the conference, uh, just uh, get registered. And when registering, you will find an option for applying for scholarships. All right, so those were some of the announcements. Um, and today we have uh, Joff Dobson with us. Who's going Sorry, to didn't, can I do an announcement real quick? Sorry. Oh, sure, absolutely, sure. Shannon, go yeah. ahead. Um, just as a reminder, I put into the chat a link to a microsite registration page for the all hands meeting for the South Big Data Hub. And I'm going to see if I can share my screen real quick, just to hopefully you're seeing it now. And this will be a virtual meeting on the 28th to the 30th. And didn't I owe you a follow up because I think um, this working group or your center at um, Arkansas could be a great booth option. But those three track, six tracks: um, data science, education, and workforce, smart and resilient cities, data sharing, cyber infrastructure, health disparities materials and advanced manufacturing and team science. And the nature of the tool we're using, AirMeet, does allow for booths, much like you might see in a trade show, but it'll be virtual. And so it's an opportunity to showcase research, posters, activities, website, whatever. And then I'll follow up with you on, on talking about that, but it's a great uh, feature, no cost. Uh, it'll run the three days with some plenary sessions each morning and then tracks in the afternoon around each of the um, priority areas or the topics and what the platform allows you can come in and look at the booths and decide which track you want to go to so it provides optimal flexibility so even if you're not free all three days please come check it out and please register if you have any questions feel free to reach out to me i'll put my email in the chat all right i'm done thanks that is awesome, Shannon. Um, uh, I will certainly follow up with you on how to set up the virtual booth. We have some ideas. We kicked around those ideas over the email uh, for the Social Cyber Security Working Group, as well as the Cosmos uh, Center that, um, uh, as you suggested, that will be an awesome opportunity for Cosmos also to showcase some of the work that is relevant to the working group. All right. I will also invite some of my students to uh, yes. man the virtual booth. <laughs> yes, perfect. That's excellent. Good use. Absolutely. All right. So thank you for that announcement. And now, uh, let's see, is there anyone in the working group audience who hasn't had a chance to introduce themselves in the past? I think I see all familiar names, so we can uh, skip that and directly go to uh, Joff's presentation. So first, uh, let me introduce Joff. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Joff Dobson, uh, who's going to speak today uh, at the working group. Joff is a computer engineer at Carnegie Mellon University's Software Engineering Institute where he helps design and deliver cyber warfare exercises to the US Department of Defense. This includes working with the regional cyber centers, bringing teams in for competitions and coming up with experiments. I'm sure that must be very exciting, Joff. We look forward to hearing all of that. Joff is also a grad student uh, associated with the Center for Computational Analysis of Societal and Organizational Systems, also known as CASOS which is part of the Societal Computing Program in the School of Computer Science. Joff is actively researching cyber team behavior and performance. 
He specializes in agent-based modeling techniques to stimulate uh, cyber team performance. And I've gone through several uh, papers of Joff that were published at SBP Brims. So he has a very active research portfolio. Uh, thank you, Joff, for uh, agreeing to speak to the working group. And we are all excited to hear all the wonderful things that you're doing. Over to you. Hey, great. Thanks. And uh, nice to meet everyone. Um, I've actually been to a few of these over the years. Uh, some of the presentations that there was one on, on campus at Carnegie Mellon a few years back that I attended. Um, so I, I know about this working group and, um, and I, I, uh, part of the thing that's pretty cool is the, the sharing of data and whatnot. And that's kind of like what, um, you know, the theme of, of this presentation will be is, is I'm going to show you like what my model is. And then, and, and essentially my model is a data generation machine to try to figure out, um, how cyber teams perform. Um, so I'll share my screen now. Hmm, let's see. When I click share, it's making me choose things instead of just my screen. Yeah, there is an option you can share the entire screen or just the window. There you go. Let me see. So if I switch my screen, do you see a website now? No, right now we are seeing the presentation slide deck. Okay, I'll just stick to that. Let me see. Share. I own, I don't see this full screen. I've never seen this before. I've never seen this view where I can't share the end screen. Uh huh. If you want, I can to stop, yeah, yeah, if yeah. You want to stop sharing and then reshare. Yeah, for a moment, I saw the uh, website uh, or a browser. So if you want to, yeah, stop sharing and then reshare the whole desktop, then you may be able to show us what you are seeing on your computer. Yeah, when I click share, this is the first time I've seen this view where it, in, in this box, it doesn't say uh, screen or desktop. So I'm just gonna do the presentation and I'll see if I can switch sure. in a bit. So. Chris, okay. zoom and it's updates. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've never seen that. That's that's for I, I use Zoom like constantly. I've never seen that that box with those options. Anyway, uh, yeah. So I'm Jeff Dobson, and this is CyberFit, um, an agent-based modeling approach to simulating cyber team performance. So, a couple of considerations to get started. Consider you are a cyber cyber ops planner tasked to match cyber protection teams with missions. So, which, what what tool can you use to help aid the, aid that decision? Maybe Microsoft Excel, or usually it's your gut feeling, is what I hear from the field. Um, or your wargaming of projected conflict with the DOD's most sophisticated simulation tool, which is called OneSAF, and you want to simulate different cyber team makeups and projected scenarios. And it turns out you can't. So, um, like Nitin said, I, in my full time employment, I work with um, troops just like those that are on your screen, and we stand in front of big boards and try to figure out how to, how to, how to simulate cyber teams um, engaging in cyber battle uh, in the new terrain, which is called cyberspace and like what the, what those things mean and, and how do we determine whether or not the, you know, the team is doing well and things like that. And I've been doing that for seven years now. And over the course of those years and standing and, and watching a lot of these exercises, I got the idea that maybe we should write some code that, you know, simulates those things. That's kind of where I got started with this research. And then I, I read, a, you know, some documents that was essentially calling out this problem. So there, this is the DOD cyber strategy. Um, this is, I believe, from 2016. And it's saying that we need to have modeling and simulation capabilities necessary to assess the effectiveness of cyber operations and also to assess the capacity of the projected cyber mission force to achieve its mission objectives when confronted with multiple contingencies. And then what I found is when I talked to troops, um, it's, and I asked them, well, what's your mission objective? Even that's hard, hard to explain. Uh, and then there was another document that kind of guided some of my thinking here. And there was a defense science board report that came out. And it was basically saying that we need to have a, a dashboard that essentially looks like this, that, that can track all these different things you know, in real time and, and whatnot. Um, and I, when I looked through those, I thought to myself, a lot of these are actually 
what I would consider team performance measures, things like time to detect and availability and how, uh, what the status of systems are that you're um, charged with protecting. And this problem is actually very expensive as you can imagine. So you know, there's always headlines like this and the different uh, military newspapers I follow like 400 million for training platform and 150 million for exercises. Um, some of these things are things that I get involved with over at SEI. And then the last one that was, that was pretty interesting was um, this, this executive order on America's cybersecurity workforce from two years ago that uh, DHS was charged with having an annual cybersecurity competition. And the goal was to identify the best teams. So really, what is the scoreboard when you have a cyber conflict? And I, and, you know, I, think, I thought a lot about that. And I think that agent-based modeling would be a great approach to trying to, to just figure that out, essentially, just you know, start from the ground and figure out what are these, these scores and whatnot. So, uh, and as most of you on this um, group probably know, agent-based modeling at the center is agent-based artificial systems that have, and each agent has, has environmental um, variables and rule sets that, that uh, provides emergent behavior. There on the left, then up to the top, you're gonna you know, propose how these things kind of interact with each other. Uh, and then finally to the right, then, then you can kind of come around and do some some computational experimental design. So I've, I've been kind of like traversing through this loop over and over again for several years. Um, agents, uh, according to some of the, the leaders in this in this area, Bonnaboo, McCall and North. So agents are individually assessed at situation and makes decisions on the basis of a set of rules. And an agent is identifiable, situated, goal directed, autonomous and flexible. So I said to myself, what are the agents here when, when we're looking at a cyber conflict? And I, I think that you really have two main types of agents. You have forces and you have terrain, and then you have links that, that connect those agents together, and, and that's how they interact with each other. So forces can interact with other forces, forces can interact with terrain, and terrain can interact with terrain. And so when I say terrain, terrain's a, a historical military term, and now that cyber is a actual terrain, um, according to the to, to NATO and, and USDOD and pretty much every military now, you, you have to uh, take the terrain and maneuver to the terrain and, and things like this. So like it says there, the force agents are the military personnel, the terrain agents are the military computers. And then, so then once you, you, you kind of wrap your head around that, you can start to ask questions, like the questions that you'd want to know from a military planning perspective, like is the operation effective? Is the cyber terrain vulnerable? Have we disrupted the maneuver of the enemy? How many cyber forces are necessary? So I kind of, I, I made a couple of versions of the model and presented those um, early results at SPB Brims and, I, and uh, a journal over the last couple of years as I was getting my thesis proposal together. <laughs> so now um, the remainder of this presentation, I'm just gonna kind of, I'm gonna go through the versions one to four just to kind of should get, get an understanding of how it works, give a demonstration, and then show the generated data and all the data that it that it outputs now and how we can analyze that data. And I please stop anytime if you have a, a, a good question on a slide. So version one, I want I wanted to make a, a minimally viable model uh, to run proof of concept virtual experiments to make sure the the, the, the most basic interactions uh, and rules were working. So in, in version one, we have two types of forces, defensive and offensive. So obviously the defensive ones are protecting the terrain and the offensive ones are trying to attack the terrain and that gives them uh, goals uh, to, to go through in the simulation. And then the terrain was made up of three types and they could all be in different states at any given time. So terrain can be networking or servers or clients. And based on those differences, they have different rule sets with how often they're interacted with, who interacts with them, what the what, what types of attacks might work against those things. Uh, and then the, the intera interactions are directed links from one agent to another at any given time. Um, and then I also had a, con a concept of environments um, in the early versions where depending on what environment you're deployed to, uh, like, a, like a military cyber team, you would have different types of systems present and in, in the, the vulnerability growth rates would be different based on those environments. Um, so I'll go past that. And then there's just an example of the code. So this is all, the, the first three versions are all written in NetLogo. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but it's a 
pretty powerful, but yet simple scripting language for specifically built for agent-based modeling. And that, so I had a, a version one um, uh, interface where on the left, you could set different independent variables and on the right, it would collect um, all the dependent variables as the, as the simulations were running. And what's cool is once you do that, you can, you can have virtual experiments. So for example, I was trying to think of virtual experiments that would be like, what would the, what would the Colonel want to know at the uh, cyber protection brigade? And they, they, they ask questions like this, like what is the expected effect on cyber terrain? If the adversary switches from a 15 day routing protocol attack to a denial of service attack, in a base environment with six troops deployed to that conflict. And so if you, if you, so I would run the simulation, uh, you know, 30 times in a different, different, um, different cells of that experiment. And then I'd say, well, it turns out that in, in this situation, we would see that the servers will experience a lower compromise rate than, than the networking systems based on that setup. So the goal of version, version one was complete. Um, I moved on to version two, where I wanted to add empirical data to make the make it a little more realistic. So I kind of, you know, I looked around in the literature, and I actually came across this research group at Brims a couple years ago um, from Temple, and they had gone around to different cyber war exercises and actually counted how long it took for um, the bad guys or the attackers, bad or good, depending on you know what side you're on, but the the they would watch the attackers and actually time them through what's called the intrusion chain. And that was an interesting, you know, more realistic addition that I could put into my model because before the attackers would just always attack a system. But in real life, you have to go through what's this concept of the intrusion chain. Uh, Lockheed Martin probably has the most famous one. Their picture looks like this, which is the, they call it the cyber kill chain, where you have to do recon, you have to weaponize, then you have to deliver the payload, have, the exploitation has to happen. You know, you have to go through all these things to the point where you finally get to actions on objectives, which is what you're actually trying to do um, with that compromised system. So I added that into the model and made the attackers go through all the phases. And then I could, and then what was cool is I could count how long it would take through the phases and try to, you know, first baseline it to make it match the temple data, but and then change it and see how we can slow down uh, the adversary essentially. Which means then you can ask a question like, what is the expected time? to complete phases three and four during a denial of service attack with six defensive cyber forces deployed. And then you, you and then as the exploitation rate is increased from two to 40. So I, uh, you know, going, if the exploitation success rate is very high, obviously they're just going to be able to go through the kill chain very quickly. So where, where do we actually slow down the adversary? And that's just a little code snippet of where that exploit success rate is set. And then and then this is the result of this virtual experiment, which has kind of two cool takeaways. The first one is the, the exploit success rate has a larger effect on the delivery phase, which is the, the phase before that. Um, and, and that's mainly because if, if the exploit success rate is lower, then when the attacker gets to that point, they have to, they have to start over and, and it's actually putting them in that delivery phase longer. So you, you kind of have these takeaways like defensive forces um, should ensure that cyber cybersecurity tools oops, uh, can alert on, on that phase. But then the other, the other interesting thing is uh, a lot a great thing with agent based modeling is trend analysis. And you can you can see here that once you get past 10% or so exploit success rate, there's really no difference between 10% and 40%. So you really have to focus on where you you make the biggest difference and, and clearly the biggest difference is when you go for from something like five to two you can have a real big difference on how how much you can slow down the adversary so that was version two um, i'm actually going to skip version three this presentation is a little longer than i want it to be um and then this and then so i got to the point where after i did three experiment three versions um, that was mainly through uh, coursework and stuff. And then I, I basically proposed version four as my thesis, I um, mean, you know, to, complete, to complete my thesis at CMU uh, last year. And um, that proposal was accepted last year. And I'm actively working through uh, version four. But as you can see, I tried to start really basic and then, and then spiral up um, from the foundation to now. Version four is all about defining like a comprehensive set of performance measures of cyber teams. So 
you know, just a reminder, what I started with was a, trying to make a system that can project cyber mission force to achieve its mission objectives. And that, and that ends up being this list, which is my working list of um, what I would consider like a, a really close, or at least a, a good first crack at a comprehensive set of performance measures. So things like time to react and time to restore and operational effectiveness and, and uh, train vulnerability change and rate and compromise. Um, I have some network measures in there and then some attacker based measures. So, so essentially, as I wrote the code in version four, I was, just, I was ensuring that I could computationally uh, with, with the software, get, get a computational uh, measure out, out of every simulation. And then eventually I'm going to try to build a dashboard that looks like that one that the, the report was calling for. So here's a couple, um, just a little more explanation of what those measures are, which is time to restore cyber mission capability rate and interaction network centrality total degree. Um, and it, 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 it so, the, so I have description in question here. I'm actually going to move a little quicker just to get to this, this version. And then this is just a screen, this is a screen capture of, of how I have cyber mission capability rate. So I've, I've, I've worked out, you know, I'm trying to work out the math for each one of these formulas from an agent based perspective. So essentially I'm gathering sets of, of, um, of data on each agent. So in this, in, in, for this example, cyber mission capability rate comes down to how many uh, fulfillment requests come out from a friendly force and then how, how well the request is fulfilled by the cyber terrain, which is essentially the cyber mission. The, 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 the goal of the cyber mission is to provide information to the friendly forces um, that are operating there. So here, I'll just give a demo. I, let me, I'm going to see if, if you, just tell me if you, you're seeing the actual simulation on the screen or if it's still the PowerPoint. Still the PowerPoint. Yeah, I'm going to switch my share then. Yeah, now we see. Got it. All right, cool. So this is a set. So this is the version four um, running. I switched over from NetLogo to to Repast. Uh, Repast is Java based, um, and it's maintained by Argo National Lab, and um, it gives you a lot of the basics of agent-based modeling and libraries, and then you can you know, inherit from their turtle agents and whatnot. Um, but the nice thing is in Repast, you have a, it's pretty easy to collect the data on each of the classes and, and, and the agents. So this is a cyber battle being played out um, between a adversary force of three over to the right and a defensive force of nine over to the left. And at the top is four kinetic missions, and there's a bunch of friendly forces, the little little white troops. Um, they are actually making requests. I just don't light those up because it would be just completely, you wouldn't be able to, be able to see anything because there's so many, there's, there's actually a lot of links happening that I haven't, I'm not lighting up. I'm only lighting up the links from the, uh, the cyber defensive team and the cyber offensive team. But really, this is a data generation machine. So I'm, I'm, generating a ton of data after each simulation um, where, I, where I have, uh, and right now the simulation, every tick is a minute. So every minute, every agent um, is doing something. The, the cyber defensive team is either conducting an operation or selecting a new operation or interacting with another friendly for another uh, teammate in order to um, either get Get information about what they have, so they're they're sharing information, or um, reporting back on compromises that that they've they've observed. And this actually took a, a, a good bit of um, iterations to finally get to the point where the fight was fair. You know, because <laughs> there's a lot of rules in here where if you just tinker with them a little bit, then you know the attackers win every time or the defenders win every time. So I I, I spent a lot of time tuning it to get it to the point where this is actually a pretty fair fight. And I'll show you the data on that now. Let's see if I can switch back. Okay. So each of these um, simulations, I, I do some post processing with Python in order to just you know chunk the data together and then put it into um, a CSV file. 
um, based on how many runs there were. But uh, the next, so the next set of slides, I'll show you some of the results of some simulations I did we, in the last couple we, weeks. Have you seen your slides? Yeah, hold, is it's it nothing right now? I'm still seeing the software, the demo. Got it. Let me see. I am. Perfect, thank you. Okay, cool, thank you. So, so yeah, each sim so each simulation um, is a ten day simulation. So this and, and I did that just to get um, somewhat of a realistic like time frame. So you would imagine that's like a, a ten days of a cyber conflict um, where a, a team is deployed and and going against an adversary. So that means fourteen thousand four hundred ticks, which is there's fourteen thousand four hundred minutes in um, a ten day period, and then I can chunk those up and you know group the data however I want, and you know I'll just and I'll show you some of those results. And each simulation, so each one run is about six hundred ninety megabytes of all of those measures I showed you before. You know I'm I'm, I'm collecting information requests, the type of request, the type of operation whether or not the defender was successful or not successful, um, how long the attacker takes to do things, whether or not their, their exploit was successful, what type of uh, vulnerability it was. Um, some of it I'm not even using yet, I'm not even sure, sure what to do with, but I just wanted to get it all and then you know, look through what's, what's the most interesting or relevant. Um, yep, so let me actually switch to this view. And so here's like an example of terrain vulnerability rate. This is one of those ones that's like the most obvious of what a cyber team wants to do, which is keep the terrain at the lowest vulnerability rate possible. Um, so in the upper left there, we see the terrain vulnerability. So also keep in mind, when I, when I start the simulation, every terrain, every computer has zero vulnerabilities. So it's kind of like the, the first, you know, zero to 100 is just like that natural, you, you open computers and they're gonna become vulnerable over time if they have zero vulnerabilities. So after 100, 100 um, hours, now we're kind of getting to that point where it's, it's leveled off and uh, they're keeping the vulnerability rate around 0.1, anywhere from 0 0.08 up to like 0 0.11. And that's the total number of vulnerabilities out of total possible vulnerabilities in the in the terrain they're responsible for and you know you can see at that point there's there's it's going up and down and it's still trending up a little bit so i did you know i i fit the curve there below um a logarithmic curve and then on the right um that's the that's the graph of um the derivative of that other curve which is you know dx dy so the change so you can see that it, it's hovering around zero for, for most of the end of the of the simulation, which means it's a, a it's a good fight essentially. The, the the attackers are keeping the defenders busy and the defenders aren't able to make the vulnerable the terrain that much vulnerable. It's, it's like an even fight. And then similarly with terrain compromise rate, so the number of systems that are compromised at any given time um, over divided by total number of systems. And a um, little more variance in that one, uh, but you can see that the compromise rate change is pretty steady. So it, as, the, as the attackers are able to um, affect a machine, the defenders eventually notice it. They, they see that it's compromised. They message each other, and then they go and, and restore that system. Um, so one thing that I found is that if, if, if you tune that just a little, it, it, a little more in the attackers, um, make, make it a little easier for the attackers, I, either add more attackers or less defenders or make their success rate a little higher, it quickly becomes like, you know, one, the, the attackers will just take over every machine uh, eventually. So, um, and then some other things that I collect like interaction data. So this is a, a uh, this is the, a, like a dyna dynamic network analysis of total degree centrality of the messages between amongst the, the cyber team. So there's been some research on this um, before with how, how well teams interact like in cyber um, exercises. So I actually have a colleague I've worked with at Army Research Lab that, that has done some things like this where they try to um, observe interactions between um, teammates. And so I'm doing the same thing in the simulation. Every time there's a message sent, then I, I, I track that data. And then you can see these are the top. So this, this is from, this is a uh, output from, from our network science tool, Aura. And 
Defender 60 is clearly the highest um, level of total degree centrality, and that's because Defender 60 is the team lead, and the others are you know squad members. So so you so it it is behaving as I'd expect. The team lead is going to have more total degree centrality, um, most interactions with others. Uh, part of the code is when you find compromises, you immediately alert the team lead. You know, for example. Um, but then on close to centrality, Defender 60 isn't in the top, it is actually last because when there's um, problems, the team, the, the higher skilled team members will take care of the problem and also message, message team, um, members within their team. So we say that, see that play out in the data and the simulation. And um, yes, yeah, so and this, this is just like a ranking of the, of the, this is a ranking of the entire team on close to centrality. So Defender 60 actually has the lowest close to centrality, the team lead. So that was, that was I'm, I'm, and part of what I'm doing right now is just trying to make sure the data looks like we would expect it to look, right? So like a face validation in, in ways. Um, and then another measure is operational efficiency. So for this one, every operation that, the, that a Defender uh, takes on it has a severity level but between one and three, and that's actually modeled after um, the DOD's mission assurance categories. So a more, a more severe operation gets weighted um, three, and then, and then you know, two weighting on severity two and, and a one weighting for severity one. And then uh, every single operation that they select has a completion requirement. So just like in real life, you know, if, if you start an operation, and there's a completion, it needs to be done in, in, let's say, 60 minutes. If you can do it in, in 15 minutes, then that's a much higher, you're much more efficient uh, than, than if you, the person got it done in 60 minutes. So every operation that comes out of the simulation, I run it through this um, algorithm, and then, I, then we can see by operator who is the most efficient. Um, so part of what I'm doing, I, I kind of feel like I'm just making like baseball cards, you know, for the cyber team. I've always been a uh, baseball stats geek, so this is why it's been kind of fun. Uh, I think I've, I think it's the last one. Yeah, this, this is the last one for this presentation. Uh, so then I I looked at for those 10, 10, 10 runs of the ten day simulation. What is the attacker compromise uh, success rate and time to compromise? And that's that's what where this data comes out. So um, the compromise success rate on average was uh, 0.128. Um, that might probably seems a little high, like in real life, but I, I would assume, but maybe not. Like this, this is one of those ones where it's, it's really hard to validate because, you know, who knows how many, who, who knows what like, you know, this cyber criminal group's actual attack success rate is, but it's nice to try, at least, you know, we can define it in a, sim, in a simulation and then see what, you know, how we can uh, make changes to those things. And then time to compromise is like the total amount of time for their campaign divided by the successful attacks. And that's the average time it takes to um, successfully compromise one system. So that was one, 141 minutes on average. And then uh, the whole idea here is not once I've gotten this, uh, once I get to this point where um, the simulations are running well, I'm going to conduct several virtual experiments. Um, and this is actually the work that I just began is now funded through an Air Force Research Lab grant where uh, one of the, the call outs was to try to understand how does knowledge, skills, and experience um, differentiate outcomes. So uh, this, I, I haven't, so this is an example of a virtual experiment table that I could, I could now run with this version where I could change the skill set, um, low, medium, and high, and I could change that on knowledge, skill, and experience, and then, you know, run run different, so, so run some simulations and see, are you better off with higher knowledge? Are you better off with, you know, more experience? And the, the research questions there are around, you know, what, what is the, the least costly or, you know, easiest things to improve? So if I have a cyber team, is it better to spend money on SANS training, you know, individually? Is it better to shadow um, more experienced team members like that's, you know, on the job training? Should we reward troops with more experience so we don't have them get this really awesome experience and then and then uh, quit the army and and join a private company for twice the money like a lot of them do when I talk to them at the at Fort Gordon. So 
yes, yeah, so it's kind of like what, you know, what, where do you get the most bang for your buck um, when you're thinking about something on an agent, on an agent level or troop level of knowledge, skills, and experience. So that's where I plan to do um, the next, the next several months of, of work on this. Okay, so that concludes my uh, presentation and I'm happy to take questions or talk about what, you, what your thoughts are. Thank you, Geoff. Uh, that was fascinating. It's always interesting to see how a uh, simulation uh, environment can lead to uh, decisions in the real world. And I think uh, we have a question to that uh, direction from Shannon uh, on the chat. And I can read the question. Uh, Shannon has said, uh, how do you validate an agent-based model in this context? Yeah, so um, I've thought a lot about that with my advisor, Dr. Carly, <laughs> and uh, negotiated that a little bit. Um, and and that, so actually my next, my next couple, couple slides, I, when I first um, got the um, invite for this, I wasn't sure if it was a full hour or what the time was. So I actually had, I actually had some model validation plans <laughs> on, on my slides. So um, I'll just present those next couple slides here because this is exactly what I'm thinking about. Uh, first, According to McCall and North, uh, th th this book, Managing Business Complexity, is really good. If I was, if I ever, you know, become a professor and teach a class, that'll be required reading for agent-based modeling because um, they actually go through what they describe as the seven types of agent-based model validations, and they are requirements, data, phase, process, model output, and agent in theory. So, you know, I, I, so I kind of I read through all those those chapters in the book and just thought about. For specifically for my simulation, what is the most, you know, what could I actually do? And the first one is requirements validation. And, you know, so I actually just got IRB approval um, a couple of weeks ago to, to do a survey and then a focus group with military um, planners. So essentially walk through, well, the, for, first the survey, I'm asking questions um, just out to the, you know, to the field of, how do you interact with your team when you're uh, engaged with an incident? Um, how do you uh, determine your performance measures? Um, what are your what is your what is your knowledge, skill, and experience like a self assessment of their knowledge, skill, and experiment experience? So the so the idea is from that survey, I can actually seed some of the virtual experiments that then I can talk to a focus group about. So that's like requirement validation. Um, face validation is is just kind of like well. Basically, what I was talking about before, like after you run the simulation, does does 0.12 attacker success rate seem reasonable? You know, so I actually could go through that question with experts um, on, on all the different data that comes out of this. And then the, the most interesting one for sure is the model output validation. So I'm actively looking at um, ways to get some data from competitions and exercises. This, this is for sure the hardest one because I've actually, there are some data sets out there. And this is what I like about this group is talking about this type of thing because um, there are some data sets out there from some cyber exercises. But, you know, like I have, I have like bro data, Moloch data, some NetFlow data. But the problem is, it's like, I don't know how many people are on the team. I don't know when the attacks happened. I don't know what type of machines they're on. I don't know the size of the network, you know? So it's like, you have to, so, I've, I've thought about doing some, um, so the, probably the easiest one here is, is, is like NetFlow data. So I can at least get, if I have IP address to IP address traffic, I could at least know the total number of nodes in that network and how often they were communicating. And that's something that I can easily simulate. So that, that, that's probably my best guess at like a output validation as of now. And theory validation is a little bit more, you know, it's like the more, abstract one where you're essentially baking some theory into the the, uh, the model. So theory validation is, do you get it re peer reviewed and published? <laughs> yeah, there you go. So I had another follow-up question if that's okay, Nitin. Yeah. Oh, actually not a follow-up, but you know, the next step, skills, knowledge, and experience, right? Is that it? Skills, knowledge, experience, are those the three? Yep. Yeah. So that, seems to me like you would have applications in any space. Do you I mean, is, 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 do you think there'd be some unique features to cyber threat analysis? Or do you think that the, the model could be used elsewhere? Oh yeah, it could, it could definitely be used elsewhere. And I'd say specifically, 
me see if I can find this one little slide I have that kind of have a nice little picture of how those um, how how knowledge, skills, and experience affects this model. And I, but I think it I think that that generalizes across many different things. So here's um, I have to switch my share. So this is the agent-based rule set within the code where, so basically each agent at, whenever they need an operation because they're, they're either done with something or they messed up, um, they select an operation and immediately they decide, can they do that? And that's based on knowledge. Right. So, and I think that's pretty generalizable. Like, you know, you think of a, a, a work crew and it's like, hey, we want you to do this. Why well, I, I can't do that. My, I don't have the knowledge to do that thing. So then I'm gonna, just gonna select another operation. But if they so then if they do have the knowledge, they move on to conducting the operation. And the way the code works on on CyberFit, uh, the skill determines the correctness and the experience determines the speed. So they're they're in the operation, and I essentially have a, a, some random variables that come up. Um, that's where the stochasticity comes into play. And based on their skill, they're more likely to get that correct. And then. And then they and then they stay in that operation for for a, a number of ticks, all based on their experience. So those things play together. Um, but yeah, I think it. I think this is pretty a pretty good general, you know, way things things go in the real world on pretty much any task. Interesting discussion, Jeff. Um, let's see if we have any questions from our audience. We have Menardin, Steve, and Ogre. Do you have any questions? Okay. Um, I want. I wanted to ask. Um, maybe this can help uh, elaborate a little bit more on the discussion side. Um, so, the cyber attack or the cyber warfare um, in general has seen a lot of evolution in the recent uh, past, right? So how do you look at that and specifically uh, from the perspective of uh, agent-based models and how to uh, track that evolution and be able to adapt the agent-based models uh, to perhaps uh, simulate the evolution as closely as possible? So the, that's a great question and um, is so the, the way the this work is um, focused on the defensive team. So the I, I'm use, I'm essentially using the attacker team to do stuff that forces the defensive team to react and then measure those reaction behaviors. So um, I that's kind of like a more of a, like a at least in my mind, like a future research thing where you, what are the, what are the attack types? You know, cause I could even look at like, you know, MITRE attack has a huge database and they even track like what are the most frequent types of attacks. Um, and you can look at that year over year and, and it does, it does evolve um, based on changes in, in technology and operating systems and everything like that. So I, I abstract that away. And uh, in, so in the code, the attackers do go through the kill chain. And what they do is they look for vulnerabilities in the system. The vulnerability is a number between zero and 100. Zero represents a zero day. So only certain type, only the highest tier, the, the highest sophistication level attacker can do a zero day. All the others based on their tier level can do certain types of attacks. So a weaker uh, attacker can only, can only affect you know, attacks um, one to 20, for example. But the, but the reason I do that is I'm, I'm, I'm trying to abstract away all of the complexities in the attacker space and just get it to the basics of they're looking for vulnerabilities. They build up a list of vulnerabilities that they found in, 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 this, in the machines. And then there's a waiting time, which simulates them weaponizing and preparing the attacks and then, and then delivering the attacks. 
Sorry, I a random dog just walked through my yard. I don't know who that is. <laughs> um, is yeah. also keenly interested. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that that way, the attackers are uh, differentiate each other based on their sophistication level. But I'm 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 just abstracting that away to oh the uh, attack a uh, Sophistication level five, you have everything available except for a zero day. Sophistication level four, you have you can't do a zero day, and you can do attacks that are rated one to eighty. I'm also basing that on the um, a defense science board report. So that's mm -hmm. uh, that's what that, that was their findings from um, looking at like sophistication levels. They they categorize uh, adversaries into six levels of sophistication. Here's okay. yeah. So uh, in your research survey and uh, the literature that you may have uh, cited and read through, have you also seen um, ways to characterize the impact of these attacks? Uh, for instance, when you look at the type of recent attacks on colonial pipelines or the, the beef um, manufacturer, um, uh, I think it was first, one of the largest beef manufacturer in the US. Um, so does that consider um, how impactful that is to the, the uh, economy of the, the region or uh, maybe even you know, um, uh, disturbing the integrity of elections and so on and so forth. So are there studies that are looking at characterizing the impacts and then taking that approach to uh, uh, determine how sophisticated uh, or impactful that attack is, and then building agent-based models off of that? I haven't seen that. Um, I've thought about how to do that, and I would do it with the, the mission assurance categories. So it, 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 it might be out there, and it's, it's super interesting because you know obviously something like the Colonial Pipeline, I, I would love to know what level of effort went into that? So you know, you could you could look at it like how much effort um, is expended to make something that literally affects the globe um, yeah. and, and definitely affects that region more severely. Um, so it'd be interesting to you know do some kind of analysis like that. I, like I said, I haven't come across that, um, but within the within CyberFit, I, I do have everything as a mission assurance category. Um, that's something that's well known in the Air Force, where systems are are given a mission assurance category. Um, obviously, like you know, the system that gives out towels at the fitness center is the level one, and the system that's uh, scheduling fighter jets is a level three. You know, for example. Right. So you could say, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna given given uh, vulnerability level like like, like if, if a I would, I would have the, I could have the agents decide what systems to um, inspect and survey and secure mm -hmm. based on the mission assurance category of that machine. So I, they're not, do, they're not doing that now, but I think that's an interesting, you know, you could look at that and then you could have the attackers also seek higher um, mission assurance categories. So they could, you know, they'd have to decide, do I want to spend more time on higher value targets that are harder to break into or less time on lower value targets, you know, where does that like, uh, how does that play out? Almost like a game theory. Right. Yeah, uh, I was uh, listening to NPR last year, evening and um, there was a professor from Harvard um, who introduced this concept of uh, bullwhip uh, in the supply chain industry and any little perturbations in the supply chain industry causes massive ripple effects upwards and downwards to the whole supply chain uh, infrastructure um, from the producer down to the retailers and then the customers. They took an example of uh, beer and it was very fascinating. It's, it's a game that they have developed and uh, you may want to search about that because it's a very fascinating example. Uh, although those are market forces that uh, introduce this bullwhip effect and causes these massive uh, uh, ripples. Uh, but I'm wondering if an attacker would like to use that to, um, to uh, cause disturbances 
in the industry, whether it is um, uh, meat production or beer or what, whatever you want to call that, even toilet paper. So would, would yeah, would that be uh, something of interest to look at? Yeah, I, I, I've thought about that too. Um, I, have, I haven't come across a military, I, I, I tend to search, end up searching like, you know, Naval, Naval Postgraduate School. They do a lot of agent-based modeling um, for military research interests. Um, and I haven't come across one that kind of like differentiates the supply chain. Um, I, I have some thoughts about that. I think it'd be really, you know, there, there's, there's, there's definitely a lot of uh, really cool projects to do in that space. Um, yeah, that, your, yeah, your, your presentation yet. helped me connect those pieces, uh, mm -hmm. what happened in the colonial pipeline, almost like a supply chain where consumer prices were skyrocketing because there was just a hype on social media platforms that there is a gas shortage in the uh, Southern United States and people were just hoarding, just like mm -hmm. uh, people were hoarding toilet paper during the initial days of pandemic and uh, prices were skyrocketing here in Atlanta and many other parts of the Southern US. Uh, so I was, I was wondering how far uh, such an attack could cause those ripples to go and could that be modeled using an agent-based model? Yeah, I don't see why not. I, I think, you know, you could, you could have like a, a chain of networks where just like information flow, you could, you could um, measure the information th flow through various networks. So like that picture I had on my screen, you can imagine that's, that's one network that information has to get in there and then out of there. And then, you know, connected to the next one, connected to the next one and slow. To, so if you, if you, if you squeeze the, squeeze the pipe at one point and then how does that that there's a there's a chain reaction and there'll be an emergent emergent information flow behavior that would be very interesting to look at right very fascinating great work Jeff. um let's see if you have any other questions from our audience i don't want to just uh, take up the whole time for just having this fascinating discussion um let's see do you have any questions for Jeff? Isn't yeah, the one question uh, Shannon left, but he was saying about the if the metrics are dual in nature, or you just like switch the sign, or it, I think um, all of the measures are defensive team based. So, um, but in, in a way, you could just you know switch the sign when it comes to change or rate and stuff like that, and not maybe not just not not so much switch the sign, but also min or max, right? So the attacker wants to maximize terrain vulnerability the defender wants to minimize um so i think as of now i'm thinking through in my head like all the all, most of those measures are you know higher is good for one team and lower is good for the other team or vice versa i see interesting well yeah i was about to I, sorry uh i was about to ask the same question actually when like uh, since you work closely with the uh, uh uh, military. So I was uh, thinking that what kind of cyber attack counts as an aggression worthy of a military response? Yeah, that's like getting into uh, the lawyers. <laughs> yeah, so, in fact, one of the, it, so on that note, I actually created my survey and um, in my survey where I'm, I'm sending it out to military um, cyber operators, I had a couple of the questions said something to the extent of in the event that you've experienced a cyber attack, um, did you interact more or less with your team or the same? So that's like an example question. And one of my advisors said, don't write cyber attack because that'll cause people to go, uh, am I allowed to say that was an attack or, you know, that, I mean, that's like, that's, that's a super interesting and controversial question because if, because it essentially comes down to um, whether or not a a commander at a certain level declares that that action was an attack, and if it was an attack, um, there's like these different titles in the U.S. Code that then uh, you know legally justify certain reactions and uh, what commanders can take action right away versus what they would have to get. Um, 
presidential or secretary of defense or Congress to approve. So that's something that I don't, I don't know. I actually don't even really know a lot about. I wouldn't. Even, I don't even know who knows a lot about that, even in my my circle of of uh, researchers and whatnot. That's, that's Thank, you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. I think that was the last question. Uh, thank you, Sheikh, for asking the question. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for your time this morning. And uh, feel free to uh, stay in touch with the working group as you have been. Uh, next week, uh, we have SVP conference. Uh, I assume you will be there. So we will <laughs> bump, bump with each other. Thank you yep. for your time. And thank you, everyone, for joining in today morning. And we will have our next uh, working group meeting uh, next month, the first Thursday, as always. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice rest of the day.